Hi everyone and welcome to our first episode of Equivalent 2. I'm Abby and I'm Sophia and together we're going to explore the unspoken truths about STEM. The barriers and challenges that underrepresented groups in STEM face. How we can make STEM culture more supportive and functional for everyone. And what experiences and advice the Imperial community has to offer. We've teamed up with Dr. Shini Samara. Shini is a mechanical engineer, media broadcaster, and science communicator. She's committed to making the world of STEM a more inclusive, diverse, and welcoming space for everyone. Every episode, we will dissect the honest and vulnerable conversations that Shini has with some of Imperial's impressive scientists, teachers, students, and alumni. In our first episode, we're gonna delve into one of the most important fields that we should be talking about diversity in. That is AI. Shinny has interviewed our lecturer, Dr. Kanta Dihau. Abby and I are studying for a master's in science media production here at Imperial. So we're learning a combination of science communication and media production. So learning how to make science documentaries and radio and things like that. And Kanta teaches our course, Science and Social Contexts. So in her conversation with Shinny, she has some really great insights into why STEM looks the way it does today.
So we have both the history and the stories we tell contributing to how STEM, the STEM industry looks today. I think what I found most interesting about Cantor's research is just the idea that the stories we tell shape how STEM culture and the world around us look. And I actually find it really interesting how a lot of people's knowledge of history actually comes from fiction, like fiction books and fiction films. There was Hidden Figures recently, which is about a team of female African-American scientists and mathematicians who served like a really key role in building up NASA's space program but we might not have known that from what we learned in school so it's, it's cool that there was a film about that. Yeah I feel like film and stories are a really good tool to rewrite history and um, yeah it, it reflects how we see the world and therefore how we build the world around us um, and I was just thinking about Oppenheimer and the in, what is it called the Atomic bomb? No, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch. The impression. The, um, <laughs> no, the Im imitation game. Imitation game, yeah. yeah. The imitation game and Oppenheimer, and those informed me a lot about history during that time as well. Yeah. Is there anything that comes to mind that really influenced how you view the world of STEM by any chance? Yeah, a book I read recently is called Lesson in Ke Lessons in Chemistry. It's a fiction book, um, but I think it probably reflects what it would have been like for a woman in the 50s to, to be a chemist. So this this character, she's has this huge intellect, but she has, hasn't has been able to gain her PhD because of sexism and the way that women are treated in chemistry. She ends up doing a lot of work for the lab, but other people take credit for it. And I thought it was a really powerful book. I really enjoyed the story. And I see it everywhere as well. So like when I'm in Waterstones having a little browse, it's at the front, or it was at least when it first came out, it was really popular. And I always see people reading it on the tube. And I mean, I'm a chemist, I have a chemistry degree. And it's nice that a book that I can really resonate with also seems to resonate with a lot of people or a lot of people are interested in it. Yeah, a little tangent, but this is really <laughs> reminding me of the woman that I met on the train yesterday. <laughs> so she was a chemist. She was much older. I think she was in her late 60s and she had studied chemistry um, in Warwick University. She said that she was one of um, six pupils, uh, six women in her whole cohort. And by the end of the um, end of the degree only four of them actually graduated so a lot of people had dropped out because the stem culture was not supportive of them and they were um, she says she felt like the men in her course kind of were front and center and that she, they were kind of fighting for their space there they didn't feel like they were really there to do the real business they were kind of just there because they were they let them in you know they were in, oh come on you can come be here but it wasn't that they were taken seriously so I, I think it would have been great for her to have read something like this. Yeah, it, it probably speaks to the fact that even though this is a fiction book, it gives a sense of what it might have been like in the 50s for yeah. a female chemist. Yeah. Um, and so Kanta also talked about how she had entered spaces and stood out just by virtue of our identity. We also asked some of the students at Imperial College to reach out and share their experiences on um, going into different fields they're surrounded by people who don't look like them. They had any particular experiences like that? Uh, like literally yesterday, got told that like being a director of photography is literally impossible for a woman. So I was like, well, thanks. And until now, I've never thought about how my gender could affect my career. I went to see Dune yesterday and I watched all the executive producers, like at the end, like a... Uh, the filmmakers and stuff and they were all men and I was like this is so sad and I'm just wondering I don't have any role example of like a woman who made it into the film industry and who's famous and I think what really would help is having women come and talk to me saying this is what you need to do yes it's like what what can you do to make it easier for you as a woman in the film industry I'm really scared I don't have the answer <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I like this this clip because it, it sort of calls to attention that obviously this isn't just a problem in STEM. Um, so the course that we're doing is science media production. So we have most of us have science backgrounds, but we're learning how to make science documentaries and science radio and things like that. So we're kind of coming from two different fields that are both 
male dominated and how to navigate that in in both ways yeah i think it's this clip we particularly resonated with because it's a world that we're going into as well so it's i think it's very um i don't know it was i I really liked hearing her say that she was scared i think it's nice to hear that as well because we don't have the answers either yeah and we were talking to like a director producer recently and he was saying that part of the reason that there's like less women uh, director of photography in some of those roles is because they think like there's this long held belief that women are not the ones that want to go out in the field and like go and do go on location and shoot there and they they want to sort of stay in like maybe in more office based role and that that's still kind of carrying forward I think yeah so we have so we've talked about how the stories we tell reflect how the field of science looks today. What about the stories we tell about AI? And this is kind of what Cantor's work addresses.
Yeah, I think this was such an interesting topic in how AI is represented in film. And I did a bit of like a deep dive into kind of Cantor's research and also um, just this subject in general. And I found an interesting theme is that whenever we see AI, whenever we picture AI as this kind of diplomatic, godlike, um, all-knowing figure, we we see them as white. We see them as like a Eurocentric, um, like all-knowing person. Like for example, Jarvis from the Avengers. I don't know if you've uh, watched the Avengers. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of interesting. Like when I picked a Jarvis, and I could just Google image searched him as well, just so I could re- see if I was remembering accurately. But Jarvis is blue as well, which I guess is like the traditionally the masculine color. Um, and a male voice as well. So if that's most people's pictures of AI, I mean, Marvel's huge. Yeah. So that will be a lot of people's pictures yeah, of AI. Exactly. And then on the other side, going like more into cyberpunk and um, those kind of movies that we watch is whenever we think of AI as serving us or like an AI as a servant, then we usually put a woman or a woman of color. I'm particularly thinking of Ghost in the Shell or yeah. Blade Runner, um, where the I guess the character in Ghost in the Shell is kind of transcending gender and race a little bit, but um, there's the, I guess that's kind of this weird fantasy. But still, it's like it tends to be that they're women or women of color, which is interesting. Um, and looking further into this, I like found this concept called techno Orientalism. Basically, Orientalism is like when you have harmful stereotypes. Um, about the Orient and so when we think of like countries like Japan um, advancing technologically we kind of impose this like fearful and um, kind of harmful stereotypes on top of that so that's just I, if anybody wants to look more into that I think that's just a general like um, good term to search techno orientalism and kind of watch films through that lens as well. Yeah and I never heard of that before actually yeah. so it's interesting to learn about and on the topic of AI and what it looks like we actually asked you guys on Instagram what does AI look like to you and there's been some really interesting answers Ghost in the Shell was one of them so it clearly has had an impact Um, Age of Ultron which is the Avengers so Jarvis as well so we've picked some good examples there Um, some some of them are other sort of robot type figures like robots from I Am Legend Um, there's also Agent Smith from The Matrix there's Mark Zuckerberg. Which was the only, like, non-film one. Oh, wait, there's one other non-film one, which is... Yeah, Ma- well, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, there was a film about him, wasn't there? The Social Network. Oh, yeah, But he's true. not... I wouldn't <laughs> say he's a figure from film. They made a film about him because yeah. he's so famous. Um, and then there was a Renaissance painting of a woman, which, interestingly, out of ten responses, there were only, like, two female presenting ones, or sort of those Ghost in the Shell, which is kind of female presenting. I know they transcend gender. Um, and then this Renaissance painting of a woman, which I didn't, I'd never thought about yeah. AI that way, but... Um. Yeah, super interesting. And Cantor also talked about co-authoring the whiteness of AI with a white man. Um, and that brings us to another topic, which is balancing allyship, which someone else from Imperial had something to say about. So let's cue that up. Uh, when I was in my undergraduate degree, um, I was the president of Women in STEM and a lot of the time we got so many kind of other societies and people reaching out to us specifically because they wanted like more women in a field um, or basically to fill like a certain quota and this doesn't mean that they were like completely STEM related at all but they were just like oh um you know can you come to this event and we'd be like yeah of course like we would love to and then we go to it and it was like extremely like male dominated but we we, and they kind of just needed us to to show that they were inclusive to women and it just felt like I was using my members there and there was also um a time when we held an event and it was like a really big careers event with loads and loads of sponsors and like big profile names and because of our social media presence um men ended up actually coming to the event too and like they ended up kind of squashing like our own members and like trying to speak and like hog the speakers themselves um which you know i guess it wasn't like part of a quota but we often got messages of like can we still be part of the society if we identify as like cis white men and we were like yes because allyship exists um again but then again there's also like a time when you need to kind of check your allyship and it seems like Cantor's work has really shown why it's an important place to go how there's so much benefit including allies in your work i think once again talking about this with allies is the way to tackle this 
And another important context in which allyship should be talked about, I think, is positive discrimination. We've both thought about this in our own careers, and it's something that Cantor and Shini talk about too.
So I think that was a really interesting clip for Sophia and I to listen to because everything that they talked about really shaped our own narrative and how we viewed positive discrimination in our experiences of our careers. So I don't know if Sophia, you want to start by talking about your experience with positive discrimination. Yeah, so I've definitely felt at times that I might have been a diversity hire in my career. So I got my first job out of university as a science communication job. It's what I've wanted to do with my life. It was definitely a career move. The background to this is I did an internship in my right before my last year of university. I did really well in the internship. I won one of the poster prizes for my academic poster. I made a lot of good connections and I really enjoyed myself as well. And the year afterwards, as I was graduating in my last year, I there was a job um, which I ended up getting, but I didn't even think to apply to the job because it said we needed somebody who to start ASAP, but I still hadn't finished my dissertation. I still hadn't done any of my exams. So I didn't even think to apply. But then somebody at work uh, who I'd talked to during the internship, I'd made it really clear that I was interested in science communication and science education. She emailed me and said, well, why don't you apply for this job? And I did. And I ended up getting the job. And I still didn't feel really confident about it because when I applied, I didn't fit all of the essential criteria. It wasn't advertised as a graduate job. So I guess it could have been for somebody with like maybe one or two years of experience or a graduate. And I, it was only one thing that I didn't fit. I just didn't know how to make websites, but I fit a lot of the other criteria. And especially because it was my first job, it was the pandemic. And I think there was a lot of talk about like, will we get jobs? So I was feeling a bit more insecure than maybe I would have done anyway. Um, so I get this job and I have, I had a couple of comments about like, oh, you know, you're the only person of color in the workplace. There were about 15 of us. Um, there are a lot of women and I think I was the only person of color. And of course it crossed my mind that I was a diversity hire. I was already very young, inexperienced. I had a lot of stuff going for me for an undergraduate, but I still hadn't had real world office experience. Um, so of course it crossed my mind. Yeah, and I guess when people make comments when they're trying to be, you know, encouraging about the fact that there is diversity there, those comments may not necessarily land the same way with you as what they're intending to. Yeah, and with these other factors piling up, the fact that I was young, the fact that I was I was new to a workplace, so I didn't feel like I was doing really well in my job all the time. It was very fast paced. There were a lot of new skills to to learn. I'd never had an office job before or worked in that kind of environment. So with all of those other factors piling up, plus the fact that I'm a woman of colour, it, it just it made me feel quite small sometimes the the thoughts that I, I might have been a diversity hire and I think now looking back maybe it was one factor of many but I think a lot of it is they were giving a chance to somebody who had a lot of potential. Abby have you had any experiences of this in your career? So yes for me um, I grew up doing a lot of theatre and acting and um, I was lucky enough one day to get cast in a series and I was super excited about it. Um, and so I got a lot of attention from my teachers and peers. They were excited for me and it was a very exciting time. Um, but whenever anyone would take any interest, I remember immediately I'd tell people, oh yeah, I got cast because they needed diversity in the cast. Um, I'd immediately like speak away my achievement as it was just because they wanted some more diversity. That's the new fashionable thing. It wasn't because of my talent or anything. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think it was because I had this paranoia that people would assume that the only reason I was there was because of, uh, they wanted diversity. So I wanted to say it before they did. And, um, and I, I think that's true. I think some people do look at, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think some people do look at, people of colour, women of colour in workplaces and wonder if they were there because of their skills and worthiness or because of uh, diversity hire. And that insecurity or that shame around potentially being an insecure, potentially being a diversity hire, um, like consumed me a little bit to the fact that I just never owned the achievement of it. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, did that shame or did you ever resolve that or how, how do you feel better about it now? 
I think it, it's different to your experience because I think the thing that bothers me the most is my own internalized feeling of it. Whereas I think with you, it's like when you explain to other people and worry about what they might think. So I think there's two sides of it. And especially if if you're a woman of color and you have both those feelings equally, that must be horrible. Um, I think the way I've resolved it is knowing, talking to people who maybe don't aren't in my minority groups and they still apply for jobs and don't have all of the essential criteria and get the jobs. So it's not just something that they do with people who might fit the diversity higher quota. It's something that lots of people do. To, and also people who are hiring, they're never going to want to hire somebody who's bad. They're going to hire people who are roughly at, at a certain level and maybe somebody might be at a slightly lower level but might have more potential and maybe the positive discrimination does come into it a bit but it's never going to come into it by as as a huge factor because it's not in the company's interest to hire somebody who's bad just because they're a woman of color for example yeah exactly at the end of the day they need somebody who's capable and who's going to get the job done and we have the confidence that we've gotten the job done at the end of the day um and i think it's so interesting that that you bring up about people applying to jobs without fully meeting the criteria because I have read many like social media posts about that men are or white men are very comfortable to apply to jobs when they only meet like 60 percent of the criteria uh, whereas women of color or women in general they um, feel that they have to meet all of the requirements and be above and beyond so that they feel worthy to take up the space in the workplace um, which I think is so interesting coming from you as a woman of color that you felt that way as well. Um, and that's why I think it is very important to talk to people outside of your minority about these issues, because for me, how I dealt with it as well is um, realizing that no matter what, um, no, no matter what, what issues you face, everyone has a level of imposter syndrome because at the end of this, at the end of the day, I think that this is another um, side of imposter syndrome, us holding on to the fact that, oh, maybe we're only here because of positive discrimination. Um, that's us feeling like we're an imposter, you know? And I think um, if that weren't the case, we'd have something else to latch on to, to speak away our achievements. We'll have something else to feel like an imposter. And speaking to other people, everyone feels imposter syndrome. White men, white women, everyone, they feel like e even and anyone who you think this space belongs to them, they also feel imposter syndrome. And I think that helped me as well. So I was actually on the other side and I had to hire an intern. So I was involved in the hiring process of summer interns. And I think it's important to invite a wide range of people to interview, a very diverse range of people to interview. But then once the interviews are done, you just pick the best person. And I quite like that way of thinking. So I don't really feel guilty about being invited to interview, even if positive discrimination is a factor, because I have had to face some more societal barriers than than others have. But then at the end of the day, the best person will get the job or the person who, and it might not be the best person with skills. There's so many things to consider. It's like, do you fit well within the company culture? Are you a nice person? Are you easy to work with? That's also a skill too. So it might not be on my CV that I'm a nice person to work with, but it is something that I think people, when they're hiring, consider. Yeah. So I guess what you're trying to say is by the time you get to the stage of getting, of saying yes or no to do you get to join our company or not, you've had to fill so many other criteria that the company wants. You have to be a good fit for the company. You have to have all these skills that you are already worthy, even if you got the interview or you got one door was opened for you because of positive discrimination. There were still so many other doors that you had to open yourself to get to that stage, I think. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant yeah. way of putting it. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs>So Kanta's work is really at the intersection between hard science and fiction. And her, her and Shinny go on to talk about how choosing this path is not very straightforward.
And I love what Cantor is saying about trying to encourage more polymaths into the world. And it seems like the Dutch system is better than the UK system, at least from, from my perspective, because you can take more subjects for longer. Um, some of my friends did prefer A-levels or like when you narrow down to three or four subjects when you were 17. Um, but I didn't like it. What did you think? Yeah, neither. I was. I remember feeling so jealous. I, I'm not familiar with Dutch system, but from watching movies and the American system, knowing that they get to take a broad range of subjects up to high school and also in university, just how much that keeps your options open. I was so jealous because, you know, we're made, we're made to make these decisions at like, actually, I think even at 14, I was choosing my subjects for my third year of high school, 14, 15. And you're so young then and you're already kind of like narrowing, like you're sh shutting off so many like areas of your development professionally, just as um, they said. Um, and I feel like this should just stay open until your brain fully starts, fully is developed at 25. <laughs> yeah, so that means my brain's, I'm 25. Well, I only turned 25 a week ago and that means my brain's fully developed yeah. now and now you're ready to make that choice of <laughs> subject now, choice isn't yeah it? <laughs> now i know what i want to do with my exactly. life now i'm doing science media production which yeah. took a long time to figure out for me yeah so tell us about how you figured that out so yes i had a big choice to make between art and chemistry so very very different subjects yeah, I loved both of them at school. I took, for A-levels, I mean, I wanted to do like history or German. I, I was interested in all the subjects. So choosing my A-levels was really difficult. The only one I actually knew I wanted to do was art, um, especially because you can take that as like a standalone subject because it doesn't relate as much to everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up choosing maths, chemistry and physics as my other three A-levels. So when it came to choosing university, I really wanted to do either art or chemistry. And I think a lot of it came down to, I didn't have the support at school to do art. My art teacher was horrible. <laughs> I really didn't appreciate her teaching style. And she wanted me to do art at university, I think, but she kind of pushed me into it in a very weird way. It, it, the, the teaching style wasn't amazing. I didn't feel like I had much support with the school in general to go to university to do art. Um, I went to my careers advisor with this dilemma and she actually, I said, I really want to do either art or chemistry. I'm really interested in both of them and I don't really know what to do. And she told me to do engineering because there's not enough women in engineering. Oh, okay. Which is true, but that's not, not a solution. <laughs> it's not like a motivation for me. It doesn't give me any like self determination or like self motivation to go and do engineering. If I'm not interested in engineering, there's no point in me doing that just to fill a quota. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that was my school's level of support with this dilemma, and it, it obviously didn't help. So I ended up going for the more academic option and doing chemistry. So then, how did you kind of? So now we're studying science media production. So how did you kind of resolve this? Um, like choice between chemistry and art is it resolved now is the question yeah. I think so I mean I'm still doing loads of art in my spare time I, I went to do my chemistry degree and I told myself I set myself a very hard rule that if I couldn't keep up with my art I would drop out and start an art degree and I did keep up with my art I ended up being president of the art society and doing loads and loads of art and about three years into my course, I heard the term science communication for the first time and I'd never heard this before and it's the idea that you can communicate like most organizations will have some sort of science communication to tell people who might not be experts in the subject about the research that they're doing um, and the science that they're doing. And so that's the career path that I went down. As soon as I heard that, I kind of knew and I knew you could be really artsy with that as well. Like you could do illustrations to show your work. You could um, be really creative with like maybe if you're doing outreach for children, lots of different things. Um, and then after I'd heard of science communication, I looked up master's degrees in it. And then this science media production master's came up about, and I'd already, I'd already been really interested in film as well, like separately. Um, I grew up really interested in animation. So I watched loads of behind the scenes in the film industry in general. And then I saw this master's degree and I thought, oh, that's perfect. Wow, that's really, yeah. That's Quite long-winded. <laughs> no, but that's so, that's really nice to hear that you found like that resolution kind of early on. It's kind of nice to show that, you know, nowadays we do have the options and there are like new courses and new jobs out there that are more open to like, um, you know, interdisciplinary work, which is so important. Yeah, yeah, and the interdisciplinary, so I, when I told people about this problem at university, their advice was always do art restoration, 
which is like, you know, putting the little chemicals and, and piecing together like really tiny bits of old paintings but, to make it look the same. Yeah. But then you're not creatively fulfilled or and you're not doing science. <laughs> so. Exactly. So art restoration, it sounds, I'm sure it's really, really interesting for some people. And I find it interesting if you like gave me a talk on it. But as a career path, it did not appeal to me one bit. Um, so, yeah. So, Abby, you had a similar Sophia's choice with uh, between science and drama, right? And film. Yeah. So, I... Yeah. So, I also... Which, so, my choice was kind of between biology and drama. And, um, well, I guess, okay, for, for me, it wasn't really a personal choice. It was more just... I knew that I was interested in science and art like broadly and I just was looking for something to fill me but the kind of sentiment that I grew up with was so I, I looked up this uh, quote that I kind of vaguely remembered it's a John Adams quote I'm just going to read it out to you <laughs> so he says I must study war and politics so that my children shall be free to study commerce agriculture and other particularities so that their children can study uh, poetry painting and other fine things so this is kind of the quote this sentiment of like it's a privilege to study art you kind of need to get to a certain level to be able to study art was what I grew up with and that's kind of what my parents instilled in me they always pushed me to do engineering and medicine like Shani said and that they thought that's like what I need to study till we can survive and have a good job and so I kind of never thought that art was available to me until we were like in a financially stable and because we immigrated from India so like I think there's that survival mindset of immigrants that limit us to choose art as well because you're like I shouldn't be choosing something that's not a stable career because this is we're in survival mode so I think that's was that's what directed my choice but now that I do get to meld both film and um science I feel I kind of feel like oh I've made it <laughs> or like oh my family's like you know we're we're stable we've we've made it but um I think now I'm realizing that actually the intersection between art and and science and other inter interdisciplinary work is important um, no matter just to challenge systems in society it's important work like social work for society as well like especially thinking of science communication and Cantor's work as well like it's very it's needed in society and I think especially for families that are still in the mindset of you need to be very financially stable before you go and follow your dreams and do the arts there's this misconception that there are no jobs in the arts or there are very very few but even though it's a competitive industry if you look at a film credits then there are hundreds and hundreds of different jobs so there are jobs out there and I think maybe that's a misconception that should be challenged. Yeah that is something looking back I realized like now that I'm more in uh, have more insights into the film industry and more arts world I can see how many jobs there are and how I like how, how it is it, it is possible to be financially stable and pursue the arts as well it's just I think traditionally um, the traditionally engineering and medicine were seen as more secure and vocational and which they are but um, I, I think it's important to note that there, there's an abundance of jobs out there as well in arts too. <laughs> and both are necessary as well yeah. engineering and medicine are obviously very necessary but so is the arts everybody gains this quality of life yeah. yeah and as we were saying before people learn a lot from film and and art is so powerful and why shouldn't it be combined with the sciences yeah. so yeah we'd really like to thank Kanta and Shinny for the amazing conversations they provided for us today and and also all of our participants um, and we'd love to hear more from you at the Imperial Community for our next episode. So just as a reminder, like we've got our Instagram, our LinkedIn and our email, which is um, equivalent.2 at gmail.com. And that's two as a word, T-O-O. Yeah. And the Instagram is equivalent underscore two. And that's again, two as a word. Um, and you can type in equivalent two on LinkedIn to try and find us as well. Yeah. So thank you everyone for tuning in and look forward to next time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for a great first episode. Thanks.